Um, I have some stories to tell you, if that's okay. Picture this. It's the middle of August. It's hot. I'm 13 years old. We've just moved again to another new school, another new community, but I've made some friends, and those friends have introduced me to a 16-year-old boy, right? Mm. He was a very attractive young man. And it's hot, it's August, and we don't want to think that high school's gonna start soon. So I go for a walk with this boy into the woods where the shade is cool and it's delightful. And we sit next to a creek and we talk and he smokes a cigarette and he kisses me. And it is the second time a boy has kissed me and I like it. I like this boy. And then he starts to touch me and I don't like that. I don't wanna be touched. And he ignores my thoughts. He ignores everything that I say and he puts his hand over my mouth and he rapes me and his body bruises mine while the wind blows the treetops and the leaves and the creek babbles next to us. And then he walks away. And I went home after that and I showered and I showered and I showered and I didn't tell anybody I didn't tell anybody because I knew if I did, my father would take out his gun and hunt the boy down and shoot him. I didn't tell anybody for 25 years. I finally went to a therapist when it got to the point that my PTSD and my depression were affecting my ability to be a good mom. And in a whisper, after many months of groundwork, I told her what happened. And later, that whisper uh, transmuted itself into a novel, my first novel, called Speak, which is not exactly my story, but kind of is. It's a story of a young girl who is raped a few weeks before ninth grade begins. Um, but it really, although the details are quite different from what I went through, uh, it contains my emotional truth, what it feels like to be shamed and to be silenced, what it feels like to be voiceless. Um, I wrote that book for me with no expectation that it would ever be published. So I was stunned when it actually was published. Um, and then I was flabbergasted uh, when people actually bought it. Uh, and I was astonished when it began to be uh, incorporated into curriculum. When they started to put speak into high school curriculum, it was usually in progressive communities like Cambridge where they would put it at the end of the 12th grade uh, year, right? Because school board members were down with that because they knew the kids were going to go to college, right? And they might have sex in college. So we had to talk to them about that. Now, 20 years later, the book is taught in middle schools. It's most frequently taught in 8th or ninth grade high schools and colleges across the country. Nobody is more astonished about this than I am, except maybe my high school English teacher, <laughs> right? And so that act of speaking up for me, first to a therapist, which helped put me back on the path to integrity and strength, um, and then through my art, um, which has then, because English teachers are amazing, the story's been handed to millions of high school kids in the States, um, and then the last bit of astonishment for me was the opportunities it created because I've been invited to speak um, at middle schools, high schools, and colleges across the country for 20 years. And more importantly, in some ways, than speaking about this book has been the opportunities that I've been granted to listen to our children. Uh, the, and what the girls tell me, often crying, is their stories, the pain that they're carrying in their bodies because so many of them have been hurt. Um, listening to the boys has in instructed me in so many things. Some of them have been victimized too. More of them are just confused and baffled by these conflicting messages they get and the absence of adults in their lives who are willing to talk about sexual behavior, healthy sexuality. I wrote an op-ed in Time Magazine. It came out on January 15th, totally focusing on those boys. So if you want to learn more about what those boys told me, you can look that up and read it. 
These kids have taught me almost everything that I understand about the state um, of our children's culture, your students' culture, rape culture in the United States. The rest of what I've learned about these uh, topics comes from partnering with RAIN, the Rape Abuse Incest National Network, which I hope is all on ra the radars of everybody and all of your students, RAINN.org. It's a new, tremendous resource for support of survivors and education of everybody. Um, and I'm proud to serve on their National Leadership Council and turn to them uh, day in and day out to help survivors. You'd think that after 20 years of all these things, um, that things would have gotten better. If you had asked me 20 years ago, I would say, oh yeah, look at how we're growing as a culture. Things are getting so much better. And then now that we know 2006, Tarana Burke starts speaking up about Me Too, starts spearheading that movement which blossomed in 2017, there are some things to feel really positive about. But we've had the, the horrifying misogynistic backlash to Me Too. We have social media bullying, targeted harassment, sexting, all these things that harm our children day in and day out. So many of our boys are learning about human sexuality by watching porn on the internet. I have a son, boy, that was an eye opener. Um, and so much porn on the internet has scenes of non-consensual sex. Um, and boys who don't have responsible adults in their lives to talk to them about this arrive at their door to manhood thinking that that's what sex is supposed to look like, which damages everybody. And now, of course, we have a wider avail availability of drugs like Rohypnol that can incapacitate victims. I think things are worse. That's part of why I decided to write this book 20 years later. Um, this is not fiction. This is my story, um, a little bit... Uh, like, like, like I think everybody at this table, part memoir in some ways, um, part manifesto, all poetry and all rage, because that's what I'm filled with. Rage about a culture that teaches our boys that their value is only determined by how much they can dominate people or hurt them. Rage about parents of my generation and younger who are too nervous or feel awkward about talking to their kids about healthy, consent, uh, healthy sexuality and consent, and rage about the countless thousands and thousands of women who I've talked to, who told me that they read Speak in high school and they enjoyed it because it was better than Scarlet Letter, uh, <laughs> way better than Old Man in the Sea. <laughs> so they liked it when they were in high school but then they were raped in college, and now they understand. Studies indicate that 20 to 25% of the women on any college campus have been raped. Studies show us that our transgender, non-binary, genderqueer students experience even more sexual violence than the women on our campuses. Studies show us that approximately 5% of the men on our campuses have also been the victims of sexual violence. And if you think it's hard for women or genderqueer students to speak up about sexual violence, it's way harder for the men because of the crazy of our culture. Those numbers don't even begin to touch probably everybody in this room who has a story of unwanted sexual contact, of people accidentally having their penises fall out of their pants in public spaces, of pictures that you don't want to have, of targeted shaming, uh, sexting, um, having your life changed because of the way somebody views or touches your body without your permission. 50% of all the rapes on college campuses take place between the months of August and November. Students are at the highest rate, rate risk for sexual violence during their first two semesters of college. It's a very vulnerable time. You guys know that. You guys are the experts of the vulnerabilities of those first months and weeks in school. An outbreak of mumps or meningitis that affects a dozen students on a campus of thousands is something that leads to immediate, effective, and dramatic action by administrators. Rape, Sexual violence, sexual abuse, and harassment 
are the worst part of the first year experience for a significant portion of your student body. That's something that we need to all be shouting about. The outcomes of sexual violence are generational. Victims have high rates of PTSD, depression, drug and alcohol abuse, and suicide. Many drop out of college after their incident. Some of them will change their course of study to avoid the person who attacked them. Over their lifetimes, victims of rape show a significant um, change in mental health status, as well as a tremendous effect on their lifetime earnings. And all of that affects their children and their children's children. Can I read you one poem from my book? Because I will be optimistic in a minute, I promise. <laughs> but this is not the minute. <laughs> Bear with me, friends. This poem is called Unraveling. I know better, she said. I should have known better. This tapestry of a girl, the fabric of her world unraveling. She said, I threw up while he raped me and he rolled me over so he could keep going. Who does that, she asked. Thread by thread, stitching the who's to her, why, her whys to the hows. She said, he didn't just rape my body. He broke the concrete of all the sidewalks so I trip when I walk to class. He poisons the air in the cafeteria with the laughter of his friends. I'm falling apart at the seams, unstrung, undone, torn to shreds. Her new sorority has millions of sisters, stitching thread with needles sharpened on womb stones, embroidery hoops carved from hip bones, patterns whispered, girl child to girl child, sewing sightless words, coding the path to survival, counting the bodies and the souls with stitches as fine as whispers, but cloth, ill-woven and untested, warp and woof never quite locking, prevent memory's tapestry from ever being completed so. She will change that by mending the tears, repairing the patchwork of her life with new patterns, stronger knots, she'll pull herself together, become the quilt assembled by loving hands threaded with intention. She'll start weaving her truth by unbuttoning her mouth. Here's the bright spot, the light at the end of this tunnel. College is the perfect place to change rape culture. Instead of being the hunting ground, college should be the proving ground for a new generation of students who are hungry for safe spaces, brave spaces, where they can learn about healthy sexuality and consent. With first year experiences that build communities so well that instead of getting shit faced out of anxiety and awkwardness every weekend, students have the opportunities for experiences and adventures of all kinds in a healthy, wonderful way. That's what our kids deserve from us. And those kids who want to have sex, um, who know that they need to get and give consent, sober, ongoing, informed, and enthusiastic consent, they will understand that world because we can help them build it with your courage, your determination, and your experience. We can make the first year experience for all of our children as amazing, healthy, and safe as they deserve. Thank you very much.